It had a little bit of a clearing. Um, there were bent over corn stalks covering uh, what is um, the body. And so the bent over corn area um, allowed for a little bit of an opening in the corn. Okay. And was there any particular item of clothing that stood out that identified that area as where uh, Molly Tibbetts was located? Yes. What was that? Her uh, bright colored running shoes. Were you able to locate Molly uh, Tibbetts' shorts? I found a pair of black shorts in the cornfield. I understand. They were only associated with her because they were near her uh, body that you located, correct? Correct. All right. And did you find another article of clothing uh, near where Molly Tibbetts was located? Yes, two, two more items. Okay. What else did you find? There was a uh, pink uh, band of fabric and uh, a striped, uh, what appears to be um, underpants. Underwear. These are some disturbing details. Let's bring in uh, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who joins us in Davenport, Iowa tonight. Chanley, I don't think, I mean, per, I did not know this, that when, when they found Molly Tibbetts, I mean, her, her shorts, her underwear not found on her body, this is... This is bad stuff. Vinny, it is. We did not know this, and I know we don't show the graphic photos on Court TV because they are graphic, but the jury was able to also see her heavily decomposed body in a position. What position her body was in, Vinny? It was... Uh, could have been a suggestive position that the remains were in her arms up over her head, her legs spread apart, uh, one bent to, uh, up towards herself, one out to the side. But yes, uh, we're learning that in her, the condition that she was found in, she didn't have her shorts or her underwear on. She only was wearing a sports bra, her socks, and her neon-colored running shoes that you can still see in the photos that the jury witnessed today, Vinny. But her Shorts and underwear were found a distance away, around 34 feet from her body, and a pink, uh, what seemed to be a headband, was found uh, another direction uh, away from her body as well. The jury sifting through a lot of these photos, and they're not easy to look at. A couple of the jurors, based on the print reporter inside the courtroom, had had a hard time. They struggled a bit with the first couple of photos that they had to look at uh, when this was on the screen. So what does this mean? Does this mean that this was a, a sexual assault? I mean, that's the obvious thing you would take away from it. Why else would you take off the clothes unless it was for some strange, twisted sexual gratification either before or after she was murdered? Right, and this is something that has been litigated in pretrial motions, the defense wanting to prevent the prosecution from claiming any sort of sexual assault because there's been no claim of that. We, we've heard the investigators, the crime scene technicians, talk about testing these items found at the cornfield at the crime scene for seminal fluid, for semen. And there was not any positive and or conclusive finding of semen on any of the items. And given the state of the decomposition of her body, they couldn't even find DNA on her body except for, I think, it was her bone fragments. So they didn't have the ability, and he certainly didn't confess to that in the 11 hours of interrogation, Vinny. So they didn't have enough evidence here. And, of course, the judge ruled that any prior bad acts, like other women or allegations of sexual misconduct, are not in front of this jury. And that's why we keep hearing, even on cross-examination, the defense bringing up, there's no allegations of that here in this case. But jurors aren't stupid, right? I mean, you can put two and two together. I'm, there's a murder. The body is found without the shorts, the underwear on, in, in the position as you described it. I mean, there's some sick stuff going on here with whoever is responsible for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. That's, to me, that's just the bottom line and would be blatantly obvious uh, uh, to any juror who, who listens to the evidence in this case. Now, whether or not there's a sexual assault, well, you know, is it even relevant? I mean, it, it's about what this jury is hearing and what the facts are. And whoever they find is responsible um, took her clothes off. 
And and why are you taking your clothes? Why are you taking your clothes off? I mean, it, to me, it's obvious that it's some sick sexual perversion, whether or not there was or was not an assault. Whoever is responsible for what happened to Molly Tibbetts. Yeah, I think you're right. Jurors have common sense, Vinny, in this case. The evidence that they've seen, the photos they've seen, just his, the statements of Chris. Uh, Kristen Bahina Rivera saying that he claimed Molly smiled and waved at him. So he turned his car around, went over to her. He thought she was hot. She, he described exactly what she was wearing, black shorts, the pink sports bra hair and a ponytail. That's what the jurors saw pictures of that were found there in the cornfield. Still some of it on her body, some of it 34 feet away. So I think that it's easy for the jurors to make that conclusion and possibly could even be argued as a motive. Prosecution doesn't have to present a motive, but maybe they will in closing argument. All right, let's talk about some of the other evidence and uh, criminalist Tara uh, Scott also testified today. Let's take a listen. Were you able to develop a profile from this particular area of the trunk that you were able to match to a known profile in this case? Yes. Okay, and can you describe that analysis, please? So I, the profile that I developed indicated a mixture of three individuals. I was able to determine a partial profile at 20 out of the 21 locations that I tested of the major contributor, and that was consistent with the known DNA profile of Molly Tibbetts. Okay, is there a statistical probability that's associated with that? Yes. And what is that? That would be less than one out of 2.1 non million. Okay, so another very large number, correct? Yes. And in, in very basic terms, what does that mean with regard to the uh, cutting that you took that we see here in State's Exhibit, um, sorry, 51? So at the 20 locations, I was able to determine a major profile. It matched Molly Tibbetts at those 20 locations. So Molly Tibbetts' blood is in the trunk of the Malibu. Is that a, a safe conclusion? The screening tests at that area indicated the presence of blood. More devastating evidence. Uh, to me, this is very compelling. It really is. It corroborates the story, the statement that Bahina gave to investigators. Remember, the jury heard from former officer Romero about what he told her about putting her in the cornfield, putting her in the trunk. and. That's what this evidence corroborates, Vinny. His, um, in his Chevy Malibu, Molly Tibbetts DNA is found not only inside the trunk, but on the seal right there, uh, the seal lining of the trunk and inside towards the tail light on the liner of the trunk inside. It is interesting that it's only a small amount of blood, though, Vinny, given that the medical examiner is going to tell this jury on Monday that she died of multiple sharp force injuries so not quite sure why there's not more blood inside the trunk of his car but it's there and it's his car it's his truck it's his trunk that he was driving we've seen the surveillance video we've seen all of that and again it, it seems a big part of what the defense is trying to do is say this is some sort of a coerced false confession yet you have now more evidence that is consistent with this so-called forced false confession from, from at least the, the argument the defense is going to make, and this completely undermines that. That's correct. I, I don't know what theory they're going to come up to overwhelm that because, again, this corroborates the story and the statement. Maybe uh, he wasn't aware that this was happening in his vehicle. Just to point out, there, there was a court document filed a long time ago where there was, uh, the defense was alleging someone else's DNA was found inside the trunk. And I didn't know really where they were getting with that, maybe pointing to someone else who took over his car and used it and he didn't know about it. Uh, we'll just have to see. But this is very damaging direct evidence tying him to the death of Molly Tibbetts. Meanwhile, some more heated cross-examination today uh, of uh, Pamela Romero. Let, let's show the folks at home a little bit of that. Well, you would acknowledge to me, ma'am, and, and the first time I approached you with the transcript on page one, or excuse me, page 21, you told him as you walked in, you said you fell asleep, correct? Yes, that was the question that I made. And when we watched the video, Mr. Behena 
was asleep. He could have been asleep. He could have been with his eyes closed. Um, I wasn't in the room. Well, he appeared to be sleeping on the video. Isn't that right? He, to me, appeared to be resting, leaning against the chair to the back of the room, yes. And then just late, just a bit later, he asked you, and you're telling us that it's a joke if he was going to sleep there. Is that I'm right? I'm not saying that it was a joke. I'm telling you that we were both chuckling. We were both laughing about it. That is what I'm telling you. Now, at a later time, you and uh, another male came in and you questioned my client. Isn't that right? I will have to look at the transcripts again. Okay, so this is a, a, a long questioning, and it's an, it's an important case, um, but he falls asleep. So uh, at least the allegation is that he falls asleep. So what's the significance of that for the defense? Well, the defense wants to say that because he was sleep deprived, his statements to police are unreliable and coerced, Vinny. They point out in court documents and on cross examination of former officer Romero that he went to work around 4 30 a.m. that morning, works 12 hour a day. That's when police take him. He goes voluntarily to this station and there's another 11 hours he's interrogated and he they showed video sped up mind you that times he was asleep inside the interrogation room. But Romero says that every time she engaged or she talked to him that he was alert and willing to speak and didn't it didn't no red flags were raised she, to her during this interrogation that maybe he was suffering from sleep deprivation. Okay, but again, that would be if, if there's no other evidence that, that corroborates what he said, like discovering the body of Molly Tibbetts. So um, I, I understand the defense is there to do what they want to do, uh, to do what they have to do, but at the end of the day, the jury is there also to figure out exactly what happened here. Um, let's take a listen to, to more of this cross-examination because from my perspective, it, it seems like maybe the defense is trying to make um, the defendant here look somewhat uh, sympathetic for some reason. Let's take a listen. Ma'am, you told my client multiple times that you were not from immigration. Isn't that right? Yes, I did. And you told him that because he was an illegal immigrant. Isn't that correct? He explained his um, status at the beginning of the interview to me, yes. And you understand that if someone is illegally in this country, that they can be deported. Isn't that right? Yes and no. You, you don't understand what an ice hold is, ma'am? Yes, I do. What's an ice hold? Does that object to relevance? Overruled. Witness may answer if she knows. Um, ice hole, it can be that, I mean, you have a retainer from ICE agent. So it's something that someone that's uh, alleged to be illegally in this country is held in custody. Isn't that right? Yes. And it's your understanding an ice hold was put on my client at 11.30 p.m. that night. Isn't that right? That is correct. 11.30. Uh, perhaps uh, it's arguably the least of his problems, an ICE hold, as opposed to murder charges and, and life in prison and dying in prison. I mean, I, I get it. I get it. But, but I don't know how much credibility you end up having with this jury if um, you're trying to make an argument that he is somehow sympathetic because of an ICE hold, because he's in the country illegally when he's being questioned for the murder of a 1,000% innocent person. Right, Benny, and the, it seemed to be that the defense is going in the direction that because he knew he was an undocumented immigrant and that when about 15 to 20 officers, local, state, and national level officers descended on Yerby Farms when he was requested to come into the office for questioning that some of those were immigration officers, ICE officers, and that throughout the interview or interrogation was just hanging over his head. He knew that it was possibly that he was going to get deported, so that would cause him to want to cooperate even more and not technically give these statements volunteers 
voluntarily, according to the defense, and that the interrogator, Romero, was immigrated here when she was 12 years old with her family, that she understood that and she was using that more to establish this rapport with him. You know, keep t she kept telling him, oh, I'm not, I'm not with immigration, that's not why I'm talking to you, we have nothing to do with that, reassuring him, but yet he's taken under it taken into custody under arrest for that immigration detainer so that was just another one of their strategic ways to try to say look this wasn't a voluntary confession yeah okay um i i get it i know what they what they do it's the again a vigorous defense is the foundation of our entire system but at the end of the day in in this case it's it's about the murder of Molly Tibbetts, what happened to her. And, and frankly, if he was deported, that would probably be the best thing that could happen uh, to this defendant because he's facing murder charges and life in prison. And there is a lot of compelling evidence, including the statements of Rivera himself. Wow, unbelievable. All right, uh, Chanley Painter, live in uh, Davenport for us tonight on this Friday. We appreciate um, your reporting and your analysis as well of everything that's happening there. Uh, things will continue on Monday, I presume. That's right. We have some big witnesses coming, Vinny, the medical examiner, forensic anthropologist, the case in chief of the prosecution likely to wrap Monday late. Wow. All right, things moving quickly. Thanks so much, Chanley Painter. Appreciate it. Thanks, Vinny. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about another uh, big case that we're following here on Court TV. It's uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, the teenager accused in the shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Well, he was back in court and actually appeared in court today. We'll show you what happened next.